today, uh, privilege of having uh, one of our most most uh, popular speakers. Um, I'll introduce her in a second. But sexuality, sex, um, one of the great mysteries and wonders of our lives, you know. And I think that that our our you know we're born. Here's what I think about it. We're born into this world kind of cold and alone, and we have these longings from our bodies to join back with the universe and sexuality. And it's a miracle. So it's absolutely amazing. And, and the part of us that has that longing, we call our sexuality, right? And it's so down deep in the center of us that it's the place where we can be so, have so much joy and so much hurt at the same time. So it's a core element of our identity. Uh, Professor Jeff Kennedy is going to speak to us about that, that element of our identity today. She is a beloved member of the FYE program. She has taught in this program until just this last year. Um, let me, I'm going to finish introducing her. I have just a few announcements. Danielle, do you have anything to say? Just the round table today at 4. Um, Deb will be speaking to us. And are you going to have a guest today? Yes, I am. Excellent. You, I'll, talk yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, and also remember your electronics, okay? So Deb is a beloved friend of the FOA program. Uh, she's a professor of nursing and herself a registered nurse. She has her PhD in nursing from the University of Arizona. She's a highly regarded professor here, teaching not only her core nursing classes, but also teaching one of the most popular courses at Sonoma State University, <laughs> Nursing for A. We'll talk about that in your section. She holds expertise in many areas of nursing care and research, including issues of combating stigma around mental illness, qualitative methodologies in nursing, and of course, human sexuality. Please give a warm up for you. Welcome to this meeting. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? No. No? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I don't know where you got all that information, but anyway. Um, yeah. I miss you, I miss your energy, I miss your freshness, and you probably know this by now, but the faculty you have teaching in FYE are so, they work so hard to bring you the best, the very best, and they are among the best professors you will find anywhere, so appreciate them, they're great. All right, we're gonna talk about sex, are you ready? Yes. All right. Okay, so we're going to talk basically about um, three questions today. The fourth question is going to be yours to answer, and only you can answer that. But the first one is how comfortable are we, both personally and nationally, with our human sexuality? Second one, how have historical forces of structure and agency shaped our values, beliefs, and behaviors around human sexuality? And the third one, how biology affects our ideas of sexual identity? And then that fourth one, one for you to think about, how does your sexuality inform your sense of identity? And is that a reciprocal process? Does one influence the other? Does it go back and forth, or is it one way? Okay, so we're going to get warmed up with a little video of Julia Sweeney talking about the sex talk. And I want you to notice something in the video. When she says the word penis, she stumbles a little bit. And she okay, so let's take a, can you see that all right? This is kind of like sex in your world today. Um, you see this stuff all over the media, and if you look to the left side, um, can you see that from back there? I can't see it very well here. You can. I'm going to turn this off so you can. Okay, so you see here on the left-hand side, women don't even have heads. That one head is covered by a magazine with a hot car on it, and then you see body parts written on and. You see some men also. Okay, so um, we're confronted with this all the time and it skews our ideas of human sexuality, but we still, even though we have this everywhere, it's very, very difficult to talk about human sexuality in a very open, healthy, and rational way. Um, yeah, there are two links here. I'm going to send this whole um, 
PowerPoint to you, to your instructors. The top link is a group of French women who became finally fed up with male government officials sexually objectifying female government officials. So they've created this link and women all over the world can write in their protests. It's interesting, they have an English translation as well. It's a little loose, but it's there. And then the next link underneath is about objectification of men in advertising and how sex sells products. And you can see that man over there is selling salad dressing, of all things, with his shirt off. It's kind of interesting. And you even saw it in Middlesex. Calliope said, read this, my mother avoided bodily matters too. She never spoke openly about sex. And for his own part, Milton was unable to discuss the birds and the bees with his young daughter. And so I was left in those years to figure things out for myself. So do you think things have changed very much? since Cal's experience? A little? A lot? All right, I'm gonna show you some stuff. These are from juniors and seniors at Sonoma State. About the last um, maybe two and a half years or so, every semester I teach that human sexuality GE course, and only juniors and seniors can take it. And every week they have a survey to complete of about 10 to 15 questions. Some of the answers are multiple choice, some of the answers are narratives. And this is a part of one of the surveys they complete. So, how old were you when you first learned about sexual intercourse? And as you can see, most people were 10 to 12. Um, six to nine was second, kind of like Julia's daughter. And notice that five or less is higher than 15 to 16. And when do we teach sex ed? We teach it in middle school, around the time of that 10 to 12 years of age. All right, next one. From whom did you first hear about sexual intercourse? And you can see friends were the big winner there. Movies were, came in second, and that's pretty scary. The movies come in second. School personnel came in third, parents came in fourth, but twice as many people heard from friends as heard from their parents about human sexuality, because we still have a lot of trouble talking about it. All right, the next one. How factually correct was the information you got about sexual intercourse? Partially accurate was the overwhelming big in, uh, winner, and accurate without any details was the second winner. Very inaccurate, thankfully, was less than accurate. So accurate had a small percentage there, but partially accurate, Big winner. Next one. When you first learned about sexual intercourse, how did you feel about it? A little awkward was the winner, and curious came in second. That was, it's interesting because overwhelmingly, the majority of people saying curious are males, not females. Um, and then it goes on from there. Weird is the third winner. When you think about people getting partially, the most of the people got partially accurate information, that might inform weird a little bit. It's hard to know. So why is it so hard to talk about human sexuality with ease and with skill and with any type of um, calmness? It's how we all got here. We're sexual beings from the moment we're conceived Sex hormones constantly influence our anatomy, our physiology, our behaviors, and our thoughts. And for most of us, sex is an innately powerful source of pleasure and expression of love. Oops, got covered up by the pictures there. Also, um, for some people, it is incredibly important to hide their sexual identity for reasons of safety and for reasons of social acceptance. So how did we get to where we are now? Can you see that? Yeah. So, um, do you think that we've made steady progression from being unenlightened in prehistoric times and uninformed up to more enlightened and more informed? Do you think human history regarding human sexuality has been more this area. How many people think this 
How many people don't care? <laughs> how, many, how many people think this? Yeah, great job. Absolutely. And we're going to look at some history right now that will demonstrate that. All right, first, um, I'm going to give you two basic schools of thought that um, we have about the metaphysics of, sexual, of sexuality, human sexuality. The first one is um, sexual, metaphysical sexual pessimism. These are kind of global philosophies of human sexuality. Within that paradigm, sexual desire always objectifies the other person, thus sexual activity is always degrading. Enjoying sex leads to a loss of self-control. Sex is so powerful that we lose control, and when we lose control, we are out of control, so we should never, ever enjoy sex. Enjoy sex. And the third one, sex is sanctioned only within heterosexual marriage because it is only for procreation. About 0.01% of sexual intercourse is for procreation in this country. But within this paradigm, it should only be used for procreation because it has to be rigorously constrained. Otherwise, human beings will just be totally out of control. And then the next one is metaphysical sexual optimism. And within this paradigm, sex is seen as powerful, but the, its value occurs in context. So it's how it's used. That is where the value comes about. Sexual pleasure is actually conducive to well-being. And the third one, the nature of sexual activity can be deeply and mutually bonding and a source of pleasure both intrapersonally and interpersonally. So as we go through some of the historical developments that have occurred, I want you to think about how these two different paradigms um, are reflected in our history around sexual behavior. Also think a little bit about how those paradigms influence our sense of identity of who we are as human beings and how it might limit human development and potential. Okay, so some historical clues from the Bible. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, Genesis. That seems to condone sexual activity, sexual intercourse, right? And then from the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, it's also called, there's this beautiful poem that bridegroom says, oh, my bride, thy lips, they, drink, they drip milk and honey. And the bride says, I am in my beloved's, and his desire, desire is towards me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the fields and let us lodge in the villages. There I will give you my love. So that seems to condone sex maybe outside of just the bedroom, if you're going into the fields, or the Sonoma State Library, which has occurred at times. <laughs> All right, but on the other hand, within the Bible, we have Paul of Tarsus, and Paul of Tarsus talked a lot about the importance of overcoming desires of the flesh, and he associated spirituality with celibacy and with being unmarried, and the outgrowth of priests within the Catholic Church came from that, that basic um, belief and assumption, and we've seen how that's caused really some problems in human behavior. Bishop Augustine said lust was the original sin of Adam and Eve. I, when I was growing up, we went to church every single Sunday. I grew up in the Midwest, and I thought lust was this like raging, heated fire that just destroyed everything in its path, when in fact lust simply means um, pleasure, delight, and wanting to satisfy your senses. That's what lust means. Bishop Augustine also said that females were always to be subordinate to males. Therefore, for sexual intercourse, the man had to be on top, and all other acts were unnatural. OK, the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, sex for anything but procreation was called a crime against nature. There was a big concern about men. Did it go up? Men secret, can you hear me? Men secretly in league with the devil to impregnate barnyard animals. Age of consent was 10, 10 years old. 
There was a virgin whore dichotomy, which um, we still see some of that to, in today's world. Um, virgin Mary, pure, sexually uninitiated, having no interest in sex, and then Eve or the evil temptress. And for 200 years, women who were accused of carnal lust or having orgies with the devil were burned at the stake, and over 50,000 women lost their lives that way. Um, men were not um, absolved from any of this. Men had their own punishment. If they withdrew during sexual intercourse to avoid pregnancy, they got bread and water for two years. They lived, but it wasn't pleasant for a couple years. All right, then the Enlightenment occurred, and some of the attitudes relaxed a little bit. Martin Luther and John Calvin actually advocated for less onerous views of human sexuality. Scientific rationalism took um, favor. That's looking for evidence to support your ideas and opinions out there. What kind of science is out there to, to help you understand what might be real or the reality in the world? Marital sex could, besides procreation, lighten and ease the cares and sadnesses of household affairs, and it could endear people to each other. Also, this is really interesting. When I think about the Puritans, I think about the word puritanical and that they probably wouldn't have sex, and yet a man in Boston was was excommunicated from his community because he denied his wife sexual intercourse for a period of two years. He was banished from Boston. All right, let's see, where are we here? All right, next person. Mary Wollstonecraft was a really interesting lady, 1792, long, long time ago. She wrote, the Vindication of Women's Rights. She attacked the limits placed on females with regards to education. She asserted that sexual satisfaction was just as important to women as men. Imagine that. I mean, that had to be quite a statement in that time. And she declared that marital and extramarital sex was not sinful. She also had a famous daughter named Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley wrote a book that you may or may not be familiar with about a monster. Does anybody know what that book was? Good, yes, it was Frankenstein. All right, well, that seemed like a step forward, but then the Victorian era hit, and it was a bit of a couple steps backwards. Women were constrained physically by corsets, bustles, hoops, and picture over there on the bottom right, that is what corsets did to women's internal organs. So as a result of those corsets, perhaps they were a bit fragile. It's pretty, pretty bad. Sexual and emotional distance between husbands and wives um, was encouraged. Men were allowed to drink and smoke and joke and stuff like that. Wives really were not allowed to do anything but be fragile and take care of the home. Um, prostitution flourished and prostitution was actually encouraged so men didn't defile their wives with sexual activity. William Acton, a physician, said the majority of women are not very much troubled with sexual feelings of any kind. Men didn't escape, however. Men had their own things to deal with. Masturbation, panic, and this is now hilarious, but at the time was not really very funny. So John Harvey Kellogg and Sylvester Graham of Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Graham Crackers said that 40 ounces of blood were lost with each male ejaculation. Now, folks, this is 28 ounces of fluid. He said 40 ounces of blood. There had to have been a lot of men out there feeling, I mean, when you ejaculate, it's one to two teaspoons of ejaculate. A lot of men out there had to be feeling like pretty impotent when they ejaculated. But, and I'm not sure where all of this blood was supposed to be going, but anyway, only 28 ounces here. And I used all my red food coloring and it still didn't get dark. All right. So, there's some, some of the language that went along with this was pretty good. 
this solitary vice, and of course women, it was not known that women ever masturbated, so this is just for men. The solitary vice of self-pollution caused cancer of the womb, urinary diseases, nocturnal emissions, impotence, cholera, the plague, epilepsy, insanity, feeble-mindedness, and ultimately death. Such a person literally dies by his own hand. Dr. Adam Clark noted that neither the plague, nor war, no, nor smallpox, nor similar diseases have produced results so disastrous to humanity as the pernicious habit of onanism. We now know that males who ejaculate three to five times a week over a lifetime have a much reduced rate of prostate cancer. All right, I, I spared you the anti-masturbation devices that were developed during that time, but you can Google them, and when you do, think slasher movie. They're pretty unbelievable. All right, at the bottom here, you see a man dying, and the small print underneath it says, representing the last stage of mental and bodily exhaustion from self-pollution. Notice that he's pale and spent and he has vacant eyes and he's turning white because all of his blood <laughs> went somewhere, I'm not sure where. All right. So then we move on. Um, Anthony Comstock was the New York, was the head of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. And he um, developed the Comstock Act in 1873. The act was titled, An Act for the Suppression of Trade in and Circulation of Obscene Literature and Articles of Immoral Use. Oh, that might sound fine on the surface, right? However, what he was talking about was premarital sex, and we think we have crowded jails now. Can you imagine if everybody was thrown in jail for premarital sex? So premarital sex, birth control, and adultery. That's what this act was about. But at the same time, we were getting a European influence. So Sigmund Freud said the sex drive was fundamental, a fundamental force in a person's psychology, and that abstinence was unnatural and it was harmful for people. Wilhelm Reich said that orgasms cured neuroses. He actually created a box called the Onan box that was supposed to harness orgasmic energy somehow. And some very famous people said in that box. He also said that genital stagnation leads to emotional and physical problems. So the next slide, and you're not going to be able to read it, but again, I'm going to send you this. These are all of the benefits of masturbation and orgasm. Every one of these is scientifically um, backed with a good deal of research. All right, the next slide. This woman is one of my heroes. Her name is Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was very much influenced by the death of her mother at the age of 50 after seven miscarriages and bearing 11 children. She was also a visiting nurse in the Lower East Side of New York City, and there she saw the toll that all of the unwanted pregnancies of immigrant, poor immigrant women took on those women and on their, their families as a whole. So she set out to find what she later termed birth control, and that word started with Margaret Sanger. She went to Europe and she got French condoms, brought them back to the United States, but remember, as a result of the Comstock Acts, it was illegal to do that. So she was thrown in jail. And she went back and forth to Europe a few times fleeing the, the um, law in the United States. Her main goal was to find a cheap, effective pill that would limit, um, that would provide birth control for people. And she did that. She found a physician and she found a woman who helped um, fund that work. And indeed, well, the Gomstock Act was eventually overruled or overthrown. And in 1944, Margaret Sanger started what we now know as Planned Parenthood. Okay, so we move on to the late 1800s and the mid-1940s. The suffrage movement was going on. Do you re what did the suffrage movement do for women? Does anybody know? Ability to vote, what else? 
say it real loud, what? Ability to vote, the ability to go to a university, like all of you. Well, not quite yet, we're still, we didn't get quite that far, but the ability to own property. Previously, they were property. Now they were able to own property. So World War I and World War II, a lot of the men in the United States went overseas, and overseas in Europe, and still today, it's the same way. There's a more relaxed attitude about human sexuality. It's more a natural part of human life. So the soldiers over there were exposed to that. Women came out of their homes and got into the workplace. So that was kind of a different thing for them as well. Um, movies began to present romance, and um, there were some sex symbols coming. Um, Marilyn Monroe was one of those. I remember telling my mother I wanted to be just like Marilyn Monroe when I grew up, and if we had been Catholic, she would have sent me to a convent. But what she did was go out and join the what was it, the Child Conservation Society, where she learned how to teach us to never question anything. It was. I grew up in the Midwest, enough said. All right, and the automobile um, gave privacy to young couples that they hadn't had before. So there was some sexual exploration going on. Close dancing of the 19, the Roaring Twenties occurred, and then in 1948, there was mass production of penicillin to cure the uh, venereal diseases, that's what they were called at the time. And you see that over in the corner. Can you see that at all? It says, at the top it says syphilis, and then there's a picture of a whole bunch of men, and it says, all of these men have it. And underneath it, it says, women stay away from dance halls. It's a real poster of the time. So yeah, we have made some, we've made some progress. But after World War II, men came back home. Women were then expected to go back home and assume traditional roles. Women who wanted to work outside of the home were accused of um, penis envy and being, oh, what was the word that was used? Um, um, neurotic. They were neurotic if they wanted to work outside of their homes. Husbands who grew weary of their wives could have them committed to mental institutions for hysteria. And that happened to a woman in my neighborhood when I was growing up. I'm old, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. So it actually happened to somebody in my neighborhood. Gay men returned and they developed a biker culture and then from that, um, the leather bars, some of the first leather bars were established. Christina Jorgensen had a male to female sex um, sex surgery or sex change. Kinsey's research, has anybody done, seen the movie Kinsey or read any of his work? Raise your hand, some of you, great. Yeah, Kinsey's work um, was published and he was, he was um, accused of being a subversive and a communist by, by ministers, by the press, by politicians, by all kinds of folks because supposedly this book had shocking content. What the books talked about was women's sexual interest and response, talked about same-sex sexual behavior, talked about masturbation and so-called novel sex acts. So at the same time there was a great demand for social in, um, conformity, the first Playboy was published and it's over there in the corner. Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's Marilyn Monroe. Okay. So, from that, the 60s and 70s were characterized as the sexual revolution. Back in 1923, Wilhelm Reich advocated for a sexual revolution, but it didn't happen here in the United States at that time. So birth control was legalized for married women, then eventually legalized for single women as well. Woodstock culminated the free love movement. Um, the American Psychiatric Association took homosexuality out of um, the disorders, a mental disorder category. The Stonewall Riots began the LGBTQ, LGBT movement, which is now the LGBTQQIA movement. And California, I just learned this the other day, California was the first state 
to classify forced sex within a marriage as rape. So lots going on there. Some of the breakthrough publications that occurred um, in the 60s and the 70s were Masters and Johnson's Human Sexual Responding. Has anybody watched um, that series on, on television? Pretty good, yeah. Um, it noted women's ability to have an orgasm. Previously, I guess nobody knew that. <laughs> Pretty interesting, and sex therapy as a legitimate endeavor came about. The Boston Women's Health Collective, this, I remember this book being published. It was um, pretty amazing, Our Bodies, Ourselves, and it talked about the need for women to be self-aware and to know their own bodies and know what they liked, and as the result of that, you would be able to have more sexual pleasure and orgasms. All right, and then Alex Comfort wrote The Joy of Sex, Joy of Sex. And he introduced a lot of varied things, experimental things that couples could do together. All right, so we're moving up to close to now, 1980s to about 2013. Um, HIV AIDS was diagnosed and the um, the response by the government and by the public was both positive and negative to that. Um, TV began showing uh, lesbian gay relationships, however they were largely stereo stereotypical early on. Um, there was continued discomfort um, there with teen pregnancy. We still have a lot of discomfort around adolescent sexuality, but abstinence-only education resulted in increased rates of teen STIs and increased rates of teen pregnancy, and we still have some of the highest rates in the industrialized country of both of those. Um, something I just want you all to know, um, there is an HIV AIDS prophylaxis, prophylaxis drug available now called Truvada. It is 92% effective when used with condoms, it's close to 100% effective. So if you are in one of the high risk groups, it's one pill a day, side effects are minimal to non-existent. Think about that, think about it. All right, and when I look at this, I think, I think about what will your generation add to this and what will your generation take away? I'm hoping you'll add to our knowledge and comfort with human sexuality. Okay, so real quickly, we're running out of time here. Biology and sex, anatomy, genes, and chromosomes, so all kinds of things can happen when the, when the fetus is still in the womb to create all of this diversity we have, we see in human sexuality. It's not a choice, it's a biological fact. So there are 70 different types of missing or extra sets of sex chromosomes. Two examples of that are Turner's syndrome, Turner's syndrome, there's only one sex chromosome instead of two, so there's 45 versus 46 chromosomes. Gender identity is female. Ovaries, however, are absent or underdeveloped, and um, they, these people don't develop breasts or periods at, pu at puberty. Kleinfelder syndrome is an XXY, so there's an extra chromosome there, and the males are not able to procreate and have small genitalia. Right, um, anatomy and hormones. The fetus begins secreting sex hormones at eight weeks of age. Begins secreting sex hormones at eight weeks of age. That influences, of course, its environment and its body. So variations in hormonal influences, um, an individual can have a hypersensitivity or an insensitivity to the androgens we're all exposed to in the uterus. Um, that can result in masculinized females or feminized males. And the 5 alpha reductase deficiency, you know, does that sound familiar from middle sex? That's what Cal's diagnosis was. Nurture and sexual identity, okay. Dr. John Money was a real life physician and you could, you could kind of correlate him with Dr. Peter Luce, the guy, the character in middle sex, he was not a real guy, but Dr. John Money was. He was a psychologist, he wasn't a physician, and, and he believed that when infants were born, they were tabula rasa, they had no conception of 
gender, they had no um, predisposition to be one way or the other, and that parents, just with their own nurturing, could make their child male or female. So the boy up there, David Reimer, was, um, at the time he was an infant, there was a botched circumcision. Circumcision, and his penis was destroyed. So Dr. John Money said to his parents, just have his sex reassigned in surgery, raise him as a girl, so they named David Brenda, and they got Brenda all of the kids' toys and so on. And Dr. John Money went out and just talked about this all over the place, so other people started doing it too. There was a sexologist and a journalist who caught up with David, and they, this is the real story behind David. He um, rebelled at every single place in his development. He didn't, he knew that he was not a female. And so at the age of 15, he had his name changed to David. He had reparative surgery done, doesn't work very well. And, but he did marry eventually and he did adopt some children. However, he committed suicide at the age of 38 because he couldn't live with what was going on. And there was another individual um, that happened, the same thing happened to him. So again, the, the importance of identifying what our assumptions are and then looking for scientific evidence to um, substantiate our opinions and beliefs. So this next one, um, this is a really, really great link that it's 20 minutes long. It's called Born Between, and it's a discussion. I mean, we, we always want to know, well, is the person male or female? Well, they may not feel all the way male or may not feel all the way female. They may be somewhere in between. We're not all in this dichotomous polar opposite place. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, sex and nature. How many people believe that human sexual behavior is more varied than what you see in the animal species? Raise your hands really high. Some of you do. And how many people think that animal species are more varied than a lot of you don't know? Okay, great. Good, I'm glad you know. So, um, first of all, there was a meta-analysis done in 2009 across all kinds of species studies, and we know that univer it's nearly universal that same-sex behaviors occur occurs in most all species. The albatross, has, has anybody seen the mating dance they do? It's mesmerizing, it's absolutely stunning. See if you can find it somewhere or go to Hawaii and watch it. Um, so researchers in Hawaii found that fully one-third of the nests in, um, in this albatross community were populated by two females. So how could they do that? They just camped out and watched them, and the fem one female would escape for a little while, go out and get fertilized, and then come back to the nest. Clownfish. When a pair of clownfish, when the female dies, the male turns into a female. Turns into a female. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, oh, dolphins. Dolphins are great. Dolphins try to mate with sea turtles sometimes. And when they're adolescents, male dolphins who mount each other, it's a, ba it's a bonding it, um, behavior, and it helps them learn to cooperatively work together to mate with females when that time comes. On the other hand, male dung flies up in the corner are um, the males mount each other trying to wipe out their competitors, trying to exhaust the competitors so they can get to the female. And bonobo chimps, how many of you have watched them at the zoo? A few of you, pretty interesting. They greet each other with mutual masturbation. And I'm wondering if that might be a first step to world peace if we adopted that behavior. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So sex spectrums, we are not all male or all female, and you know from Cal that there is a population that is intersexed, and actually it's a sprinkling all along that. Remember, 70 different ways that, um, 70 different permutations of those chromosomes. Same thing with sexual orientation, that's who we're sexually attracted to. We tend to think of it as women on one side, men on the other side, bisexual people in the middle, Pansexual people are 
all over the spectrum, and then some people have absolutely no interest in sex at all, asexual people. So it's a continuum. It's not that dichotomy that a lot of us think it is. So sexual orientation. Um, it's who we are erotically and sexually attracted to. We know that more males identify as gay than females identify as lesbian. We also know that more females are bisexual than, male, than bisexual males. The most important thing, I think, to think about is that suicide rates for LGB teens is 35% higher than other teens. And for trans people who feel transgender, 60% higher. That's a lot. That's a lot. So if anyone out there is struggling with um, those kinds of issues, CAPS has great programs. And Positive Images is a program in Santa Rosa that's absolutely fabulous. They're also in Petaluma now in Sonoma. I'm in Nichols 272 on my door. I have brochures for positive images. You're welcome to come by and get them. And I also keep condoms on my door. Um, with sexual activity comes responsibility. So it's really, really important that you know that. OK, it's time to go. I'll send you the rest of this. It's almost done. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>